guys. We're here this evening at a function in the middle of Baltimore, Maryland, which we found a little unexpectedly. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your group, the Democratic Socialists of America, and sort of the purpose of this evening? Okay, the Democratic Socialists of America is a nationwide group. It's the uh, uh, the member party uh, in the United States of the Socialist International, but here in the United States it works within the Democratic Party mainly. Uh, Congressman Dellums, for example, is in the DSA, and uh, Mayor Dinkins in New York. Uh, we have a lot of elected officials around the country, mostly at local level. And what we're trying to do is uh, move the discourse in the United States towards an understanding of what democratic socialism is. Uh, socialism is a means to uh, increase democracy and also a kind of socialism that's very typical in the rest of the world, particularly in Western Europe and Canada and so on, uh, that believes in democracy and believes in democratic processes and working within a democratic system. Well, you know, when the word socialist gets said, most people think communist. They don't think democracy. Maybe you could speak to that. Well, that's part of the history of the United States and a very systematic effort to uh, to not even keep uh, the possibility open to uh, to debate on socialism. I mean, there was a very homegrown socialist tradition in America in the Midwest. Uh, the progressive movement came out of that. There was uh, farmer and labor parties and socialist parties, Norman Thomas. Uh, and also the vice president under, uh, under Roosevelt, uh, Henry Wallace, was a socialist. Uh, these were people who believed in an American kind of socialism based on uh, democracy and access to, uh, to uh, a decent standard of living for all and also uh, democratic control over the economy. How is that different than uh, democracy as we now know it? Well, right now, 1% uh, of the country owns uh, about 90% of its resources and dictates, therefore, uh, what kind of media we get. The media is, by and large, the network media, media is controlled by a very small group of companies. The politicians are backed uh, and uh, put into office through large-scale uh, uh, corporate PACs. Uh, this is not a democratic form of, uh, of government. It has the, the democratic uh, structure and therefore allows for an evolution towards democracy. But what it really requires is that everybody could participate in the decisions that really affect their lives. And those are economic decisions. In other words, there has to be economic control, I mean, d democratic control over the economic resources of the nation through uh, um, uh, some, some um, voting and democratic procedures in industry, trade unions, strong unions, uh, uh, democratic participation in investments and decisions of uh, economic planning, for instance, future urban planning, uh, planning for the environment, uh, more mass transportation, for example, and, and less uh, reliance on oil. Uh, those are things that most people in America want. Most people in America want universal health care, but uh, they don't have access yet to that kind of decision making and the Congress they have uh, don't represent those interests yet. They, they don't take a position which would in the rest of the world be called a, a social democratic position or a socialist position. How is your organization going to push this agenda through? Well, I mean, we're doing it at every level we can. We do it through work with, at the grassroots level. Uh, we have our memberships in the locals, like here in Baltimore, our grassroots memberships. We work with uh, unions. We work with community organizations. Uh, but at the same time, we work realistically within the system as it is. We work within the Democratic Party as a left caucus, a left-wing caucus. We also have uh, successfully elected people to major offices in this country. and, uh, and uh, the uh, phenomenon of uh, Bernie Sanders is very encouraging to us as well. They, he ran as an independent. Uh, that's something we really like to see because that's part of the, the movement towards increasing the, the debate on democratic socialism in America. Ha have you elected any officials locally here in Baltimore? Yeah, well, we've worked on the campaigns. None of them have been, uh, been uh, people we put up as members of our own organization, but they're people we've supported over their, their opposition. So, I mean, Baltimore, everyone runs in the Democratic Party. Uh, the, everyone in office is in the Democratic Party. We have backed candidates we feel represent the interests of the you know, working people in this city. Um, and we've been successful in that way. I mean, many of the people we've supported, like the city council president, Mary Pat Clark, uh, the present mayor uh, we preferred over the other candidate and helped work on his campaign. I mean, these people uh, are people who've been able to win and have been able to build up a constituency, not just through us, but, but you know, we see them as representing uh, the interests of the people of Baltimore better than the other candidates.
given the structure of the two-party system, do you really believe that you can affect change within the Democratic Party? That's a big debate within our organization. It's an open debate. Many people in our organization would like to see a third party, or like a Labour Party or a Social Democratic Party, like you have in Europe or the New Democratic Party in Canada. But, uh, you know, that hasn't become a realistic option yet. Uh, it may be becoming one. Uh, the National Organization of Women has come out in favor of a third party. Uh, you know, if that were the case, uh, if Labour were backing it and so on, then we would back it. But in the present situation, we. The Democratic Party has been traditionally the party of working people and uh, and uh, party in favor of civil rights and uh, and so on. So uh, we'll continue to work within it and try to keep it on track, so to speak. You know, keep it working in the interests of uh, the majority of people. I have two more questions for you. One of the things you touched on was Congress, and here you are outside of the Beltway. Beltway, I think it's called, isn't it? And you're sort of looking at Capitol Hill from a certain distance. What's your view of how Congress represents the people in your community? Well, in our community, in downtown Baltimore, we have a very good congressman. We have a progressive congressman, Kwasi Mfume. Um, by and large, Congress is the best government money can buy, and uh, we're not too happy about that. But, uh, you know, hopefully the example of people like Bernie Sanders and Ron Dellums and, and even Kwasi Mfume, you know, would really make a difference over time. People would realize they are more consistent and honest and, uh, and work in the interests of their constituencies. And finally, could you talk about this evening and why you put it together as a part of an ongoing educational effort, and why did you have Bernie come? Well, we just feel Bernie Sanders really represents the best uh, that's happened in uh, American politics recently, that, you know, he represents a real move for change. And uh, we don't feel it's limited to Vermont. We feel this could be a, a nationwide phenomenon, and we'd like to bring him here in order to, to build people's morale, to have them come in contact with him and, and hear his point of view and, uh, you know, build, uh, build toward that kind of thing here, toward a more uh, progressive politics here in Maryland, you know, in the whole state. Are you surprised at the turnout? No. <laughs> it's Baltimore. I understand it's okay. bigger than Burlington. Harris, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sponsoring tonight, those are the Democratic Socialists of America, Baltimore local chapter, and the United Electrical Workers, uh, locals in Baltimore City, and St. John's United Methodist Church, where you are here tonight. Um, we're very excited tonight to have with us Congressman Bernie Sanders, the first independent and first socialist congressman to be elected in uh, the U.S. Congress in, uh, in 50, 60 years, I believe. Um, I think that's wonderful. I think it's great to have him here in Baltimore. Uh, before we get into the program, I'd like to remind people that there are literature tables over here by the sponsoring organizations. And uh, we hope you'll stop by and sign up so you become aware of other events like this if you heard about this only through posters and the like. Um, the person who will be introducing Bernie Sanders tonight is Bob Simpson, a member of the United Electrical Workers local and a candidate in September's primary for city council in Baltimore's 6th Councilmanic District. DSA, the Democratic Socialist, has endorsed Bob's campaign because we believe he represents the interests of working people and other progressive values in this uh, upcoming Baltimore City election. So before Congressman Sanders begins, it's my pleasure to present to you Bob Simpson. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, Harris took away a little bit of what I was going to say, but I'm just up here to introduce a man that defeated all the odds that I believe and what he accomplished. I'm sure if you talk to him, he accomplished what he accomplished of becoming a U.S. congressman. It's probably more than he, it's the best thing he ever accomplished in his life, even though he did a lot. And, uh, I had a chance to meet with Mr. Sanders in front of the RTC, which we had a demonstration. The union uh, had a demonstration in front of the RTC in Washington, D.C. a couple months back. And I was really glad to see Mr. Sanders stand up and speak up against our government, 
and what it stands for. And I'm also honored to stand here tonight and introduce Mr. Sanders. I hope I can learn a lot from Mr. Sanders. I'm not sure I will. <laughs> uh, I've already learned something from him, that he beat the odds. <laughs> and if anybody can do that in these days and age in political times, he's got my vote for President of the United States. <laughs> So without any further ado, I want to introduce to you four time, four, he served four terms as mayor in the state of Vermont in a city called Burlington. Currently U.S. Congressman of the United States, Mr. Bernie Sanders. Thanks very much. Good luck to you. Thank you. What uh, I propose that we do is I'll chat for a little while, and then we can open it up for questions and discussions. Does that sound all right? Let me just tell you a little bit uh, about um, where I come from politically and what we've been doing in Vermont. As Bob indicated, uh, I was mayor of the city of Burlington uh, for four terms. We have two-year terms, so that's a total of eight years. And I think the first point that I want to make is uh, I used to more get around the country a whole lot and, and, and talk to people and go to communities. And people, we talk about what goes on in their cities and, and their towns, and they say, well, you know, things are terrible. We have a bunch of political hacks that are running the town, the big money people are running the community. And they moan and they groan. And then we say, well, what about standing up and you know, organizing against them and, and running candidates against them? And then you hear this great Marxist analysis about the right moment in history. And it's never, it's never now. And they're building their historical forces, and certainly within 16 years, they will have that candidate ready to go. So the first point that I would make, in Vermont, we're not that smart. We're, we're less sophisticated, a little bit dumber. Uh, and we simply looked at, at what we saw. And uh, I had run a number of times uh, in the uh, early 70s for statewide office. And, and, and the first point, I keep saying the first point, after 83 points, it'll still be <laughs> the first point. But one point that I want to make is I'm here tonight as the United States Congressman from Vermont. By the way, we only have, uh, we're a small state, we only have, the whole state is one district, so I'm, I'm it. And I want a statewide race. But the point that should be understood is I speak to you tonight having gotten 56% of the vote in November, but 18 years ago, I ran for governor of the state of Vermont and woke up the morning after the election with 1% of the vote. Okay? On another occasion, I had gotten 2%. Another occasion, I had gotten 4%. And in 76, running for governor, I, on a third party, this is all third party, I had gotten uh, 6%, which is the highest that I had gotten. So the first, uh, here we go again. <laughs> first point that I want to make for the fourth time <laughs> is that major breakthroughs don't take place overnight. They really don't, especially you all understand what we are up against, those of us who are involved in progressive politics. If you run a race, the odds are very likely that your opponent will heavily outspend you. The odds are very likely that you're not going to get good coverage in the media. Uh, and persistence and doing it again and again, in fact, uh, paid off for us in Vermont. So that what happened is, in the beginning of our party, we had a third party, which is now fairly defunct. It's still in existence, but we have built a very strong progressive movement, which I'll tell you about in a moment. But in the beginning, this is what would happen. You had the Democratic candidate running for something, and the Republican candidate. Historically, Vermont uh, had been a Republican state, a moderate Republican, not right wing, and then Democrats. And then we had a third party. And what would happen is, debate after debate, television program after television program, the progressive third party people would in fact get the best response from the audiences. And people would say, you know, you guys make a lot of sense. And then you go up to them and say, you're going to vote for us? And they say, oh, of course we're not going to vote for you. You can't win. You're going to vote for the Democrat. You're a much better candidate. Everything you're saying is true, but we can't waste our vote. Waste our vote was the expression. So if there's any term that drives me crazy, it's this quote unquote, waste our vote. 
So we went through that. But in the process, what happened is you saw people would say, you know, I thought those people were really crazy, but you know, I heard them for the 14th time, and they're making more and more sense. And we got more and more votes. And we put together a pretty good group of people. Um, I dropped out of politics for a while because it got uh, it tiring and I had to earn a living and, and so forth and so on. But in 1980, uh, I, some, uh, you know how politicians always tell you, friends of mine asked me to run for president of the United States. And I, in fact, it's actually true in my case. A few friends <laughs> did actually do it. <laughs> and uh, what happened is they had analyzed, uh, a couple of my friends uh, had analyzed the voting returns in Burlington, which is in our state, uh, far and away the largest city with 40,000 people, not a very large city, but for Vermont that's twice the size of any other city. And it turned out that I had done pretty well in working class areas. And anyhow, we decided uh, to make the shot in uh, 1981. Our elections are in March, March meeting. And uh, we started off with literally uh, two or three people and almost no money. Uh, by the time the campaign ended, we were taking on a guy who had been mayor, conservative Democrat, who had been mayor for 10 years, five terms. The odds against me were probably, you know, overwhelmingly against me. No one thought we had a shot at it. To make a very long story short, we gained momentum throughout the campaign. Um, we probably, on election day, had 100 people out on the street, and we ended up winning after a recount by 10 votes. <laughs> and uh, the first year was a very bitter and difficult year because it, it reminded me, some of you may be familiar with what happened to uh, Mayor Harold Washington uh, in Chicago and, and the problems that he had with his city council, and it was some, to some degree a similar in Burlington. Their, their attitude was, if we could prevent Sanders from doing anything, um, we can stop him, and two years later, we'll tell people he accomplished nothing, and, and we'll bring back uh, the Democrats. So it was a very, very bitter fight, and what happened is, after the first year, uh, what we did is, out of my victory, I had two out of 13 supporters on the, on the city council. It was a wonderful coalition. The very first Citizens Party candidate in America uh, was elected, along with a very wonderful a woman who had been a conservative Democrat, but stood with the people. Conservative in that instance was, was not bad. Uh, and uh, so we had a coalition of an 80-year-old former Democrat and a, at that point, very young Citizens Party candidate and myself. And um, we hung on against tremendous pressure that year, and we organized a political movement that year. And uh, one year later, when half of the Board of uh, City Council came up, we won three more seats which gave us veto power. And from then on, uh, up until today, Burlington has had a very strong three-party, we have been a strong three-party city. And the progressive movement has never had a majority on the city council. We've either had five or six out of 13, but we've had the mayor's office now. We're going on to our 11th year. We've won now six straight elections. And Burlington today remains uh, a city with a good progressive mayor and five members on the city council. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that did not come out of nowhere. That came out of many, many years out in the political wilderness. Uh, it came out of, in the city of Burlington, knocking on doors and talking about the issues. You know, people say, how do you do it? And the answer is, it is really not very complicated. What you do is talk the issues that impact the people in your community, whether it's housing or highways, uh, education, whatever it might be. You tie those issues to the national issues, because I think everybody knows that the city of Burlington or the city of Baltimore in itself cannot solve its housing problems, its homelessness, its tax problems. It obviously, we need changes on the national level as well. And you make those connections. It's really not very hard. Uh, and um, so after eight years uh, as mayor, uh, I ran for uh, the Congress. Uh, we lost in 88 by three percentage points. Um, but was, it was a good campaign. Uh, the Republican, a moderate Republican, got 41 percent of the vote. I received 38 percent of the vote. And interestingly enough, the Democrat received 19 percent of the vote. And it was a strong Democratic candidate, the guy who was the leading, their leading member in the Vermont House of Representatives. So what that did is it told people for the first time, we saw that on a statewide race, that the progressive movement could make a good showing. And uh, two years later, in 1990, uh, I ran for Congress, and it was a, just a tremendously exciting campaign. And we put together the kind of coalition that I think we need to put together nationally. We had, in our state, again, we're a small state, 
only 550,000 people, we had 1,000 people in the state of Vermont knocking on doors and passing out literature. We had the support of, I think, every union in the state of Vermont. We had the support of many of the senior citizens in the state of Vermont, many of the women's community, the environmental community, uh, the peace community. We put together the coalition, you know, that Jesse Jackson talks about as the rainbow coalition of different groups, but we did it outside of the Democratic Party. That's the way we did it. And um, on election night, for a variety of reasons, we ended up doing even a lot better uh, than we had thought. We ended up winning by 16 percentage points. Um, and what's also interesting is if you analyze the, the results, and this has always been true of those of us who are progressives in Vermont, uh, we do much better, of course, in working class and low income areas. We run primarily class based campaigns. The issues are, are, are class based. And in working class areas, in a three way race, the Democrat in that race got 3%. In uh, working class areas, we were getting 60, 65, 70, 75 percent of the vote. So to me, I think, uh, and also the good news about that campaign is not only that I won, for the first time in decades in the state of Vermont, we elected two progressives to the state legislature, both of whom had been on the city council uh, for many years. We recently re-elected a progressive mayor. So in Vermont right now, you have the one congressperson is an independent progressive, two progressives in the legislature, and the mayor of the largest city of the state of Vermont is a progressive. And I think clearly within the state, the, the momentum is, is with us. Now, how do we do that? What, what's the secret? Is there any magical secret? And the answer is, there really is not. To me, what we do is so elementally common sense that, you know, I, we don't think that what we're doing is terribly radical. What do we talk about? What are the issues that we talk about? Well, probably the main issue that I ran on uh, in this last campaign is a fairly conservative issue. It's called national health care. And all that I did was point out that the United States policy in terms of health care is very radical and unusual, that throughout the entire world, with the exception of South Africa, every nation on earth, in one form or another, has a national health care system which guarantees health care to all of its people. That's the only point that I made. Okay. Canada, we kind of like the Canadian system. We think we could do it a little bit better, but we border on Canada. And people can see the contrast between the Canadian system and what goes on in our state, what goes on in this country. The English have a system which is different than the Swedish system, which is different than the French system. But there is no system of any industrialized nation on earth where you have 15% of the people with no health insurance whatsoever. 50 or 60 million people who are seriously underinsured, where health costs are going up by 15 or 20 percent a year, where you have one of the highest infant mortality rates in the industrialized world. So the first point that we make is that this country needs a national health care system. We have to eliminate the 1,500 private health insurance companies. And in the process, we can, as a recent study indicated, save over $100 billion in billing and administrative costs, put that money into health care. So the first point, most important issue, we can guarantee health care to all of our people without spending a penny more than the $750 billion we're currently spending. Doesn't seem to me to be a very radical proposal. And the people of Vermont did not think it was a radical proposal. And I'm very happy to tell you that within a couple of weeks, we will, in fact, be presenting legislation which will guarantee health care for all Americans through a very progressive national health care system. What else did we talk about, which we honestly think is not terribly radical? All right. We talked about the tax system in the United States and what's going on in our country economically. What is going on in our country? Now, you don't hear this too often in the United States Congress. You don't hear it on CBS, but the facts are fairly clear. This nation, almost on a daily basis, and certainly for the last 10 years, for working people, has become a progressively poorer nation. You all know the facts that in terms of young workers today, the purchasing power of a young worker today is significantly less than what that worker would have earned 20 years ago. Now, why is that? The answer we all know is fairly obvious. It's right in front of all of our faces. This at one point, this nation at one point, was the leading manufacturing nation on earth. 
we produced real products, quality products. We led the world in the development of new technology. And we paid our working people not very good wages, but we paid our working people decent wages with decent benefits. And they had strong unions behind them to protect those interests. And what has happened in the last 15, 20 years is we have seen a deindustrialization process by which corporations have sold out the American working people, have taken their plants and their technology to the third world, where they're hiring desperate people at starvation wages. And the jobs that are open to us and to our children are working at McDonald's or in the resorts or waiters and waitresses in the, in the service industry, where the wages are clearly very low. That's what's happening. Everyone, every economist understands that. So there are two issues tied together there. The first issue is, how do you rebuild American industry so that once again we're producing real products and paying our people a decent wage? Very important issue. I got news for you. You know, I stand there in Congress all the time. It's almost not talked about. I guess I've been learned that they educated me that when you talk about industrial policy, which all that that implies is that the government should be involved in the process of building American industry. That, I guess, in Capitol Hill, is thought to be a communist conspiracy. Quite true. You're not allowed to talk about that. If you challenge corporate America's right to throw millions of American workers out on the street and move to Mexico or move to Asia, where you hire people at starvation wages and destroy their environment, if you talk and you suggest that maybe the government of the United States might play some role in this discussion, people look at you kind of weirdly. We're not supposed to do this. Those decisions are made by General Electric and General Motors, and what do we have to say about that? We shouldn't be getting involved in those areas. Okay. And the other aspect of that whole question has to do with taxation and income distribution. Again, it's quite incredible. Nobody talks about it up there, you know? What do you have in this country? You have a situation where the richest 1% of the population owns about uh, over at least a third of the wealth of the country, that in the last 10 years, the gap between the rich and the poor has grown wider, that while the standard of living of working class people and middle income people has declined, the richest 1% of our population have seen an 86% increase in their real income. Okay? Everybody knows that. Conservatives acknowledge that. Very richest people have become much richer. Working people and the middle class have become poor. Now, to add insult to injury, on top of that, you have a situation where the rich, who have become much richer, obviously, are paying less in taxes. The middle class and the working class, which has become poorer, obviously, are paying more in taxes. Why not? Makes a lot of sense, I suppose, to somebody. And we talked about saying, well, OK, if the rich have gotten much richer, we have the very radical and crazy idea that maybe they should be asked to pay more in taxes, and the middle class and the working class that has become poorer, maybe we should lower their taxes. That's all. <laughs> now, and the truth, the point that I'm trying to make, wherever I speak, and whenever you talk to normal people, they say, they say of course that makes sense. I mean, what, rich have gotten richer, and they're paying less in taxes. Working people got poorer, paying more in taxes. Doesn't make a lot of sense to most people. Yet you hardly hear that issue discussed in the United States Congress. It is quite astounding. But the people of Vermont and I think the people of America want to hear that message. And we took that message uh, to the people. Uh, we talked about a democratic foreign policy where instead of supporting military dictatorship after military dictatorship, such as the governments of El Salvador and so forth and so on, Instead of trying to overthrow the democratically elected government, Sandinista government of Nicaragua, maybe we would work with the poor people of the third world rather than uh, constantly trying to uh, put them down. We talked about that issue. Uh, we talked about radical changes in the environment, making the point that everybody knows that if present trends continue in terms of the destruction of the ozone layer, in terms of the greenhouse effect, in terms of energy, uh, the country faces a questionable future, the world faces a questionable future. We talked about that. We talked about equal rights for women, for minorities. We raised issues that, in fact, they really are not very radical issues. They really are not. Uh, we think that on, on all of the points that we made, the vast majority of the people are on 
our side. We talked about the fact that, thank God, now that the Cold War is over, that we can significantly lower uh, military spending. And I propose the 50% reduction in military spending over a five-year period. I don't think that's terribly radical. I mean, others might suggest we could do more. But it would free up you know, well over $100 billion that we can use for education for our kids who are having a harder and harder time affording college. We could break our dependence on the property tax by having decent federal aid of education. We could deal with the environment. We could deal with the crisis in housing, homelessness, and so forth and so on. Again, I don't think it's a terribly uh, radical idea. And, and we say these things, and people say, yeah, it sounds all right. Let's do it. And I think that uh, the problem that we have as a nation is that the ideas, I was mentioning it uh, to the guys who I was with uh, driving here, is if you had George Bush over here and you had somebody talking about these issues, and you did it on national television, on issue after issue, we have the majority of the people on our side. We're not radical. I mean, it, nothing that I'm saying is terribly radical. It only looks radical within the context of a United States Congress, which is essentially a one-party Congress. It looks radical in terms of a corporate-controlled media, which does not talk about these issues. But I think if you knock on the doors and you talk to the people, uh, these ideas and many more make a lot of sense uh, to the people. So where do we go from here? I think, um, let me just say a moment about uh, what goes on in Congress. Uh, I've been there now for four months. Uh, it is, uh, what I've told the people in my own state when I, when I go back home, and I go back home often, is, is, you know, I say that I told them during the campaign that I thought the Congress was out of touch with the American people. Uh, and that I was wrong, that the situation is worse than I had thought it was. <laughs> and I thought it was pretty bad. It is absolutely astounding to me. It really is. It's like a psychological thing going on in there where even the good people, and there are some good people, you got several dozen very serious and good people, some of whose names you don't know. I mean, people who are banging their heads against the wall for 10 years and 20 years, fighting for the rights of working people, you see. And occasionally they get discouraged because, you know, they don't, uh, they get sold out by their leadership, they lose. Um, but what astounds me is not that we have not solved the problems facing these countries. The problems are complicated. They're not going to be solved uh, overnight. But what upsets me more than anything else is that the serious debate has not yet begun. Okay? So that the American people, what's going on, and of all of the things that disturbs me, what disturbs me most is that because Congress does not talk the issues to the American people, because the media, so preoccupied with sensationalism and violence, does not allow American reality to be portrayed on the television. You can't see your lives on the television. You can turn on the tube tonight, you'll see dozens of people getting murdered and raped and, and everything else, but you can't see the experience of the average American working person on television. Do we have writers who can write it? You're damn right we do. All right. Do we have musicians who can perform it? Yeah, we do. But it's not allowed on, on the tube. So what ends up happening is you have a Congress and a president who do not talk to the reality of American people. You have a media which, to a large degree, ignores the reality of American people. So the suffering and the pain becomes internalized. So you've got 200 million people walking around saying, I know that there's something wrong. You know, <laughs> I'm not the only person who can't afford to pay rent. I'm not the only person who can't afford to go to the hospital, but no one's talking about that issue. Where is the movement of people that's talking about that issue? And that is why, and, and the end result of it is you'll have a situation where half the American people don't bother voting for president. You know, in 1988, half the people voted uh, in that election. And if you stop for a moment, and I say this not being facetious, 50% of the poor people in this country, as you know, basically don't vote. You know, everyone always talks about South Africa, isn't it terrible the blacks can't vote? And of course it is. But people do not talk about the fact that in this country, I would guess 90% of low-income people do not vote. Okay? You've got many working people who do not vote. And their refusal to vote is not an irrational act. They look at the system, they hear the blabber coming from politicians, they see nothing happening from Congress which impacts upon their life, and they say, hey, why should I, you know, vote? What difference does it make to my life? And uh, that analysis is not necessarily uh, an incorrect analysis. And then you have, in the off-presidential election, do you know what the voter turnout was in 1990? Approximately 33% of the people voted. 
Two out of three people did not vote, despite the fact you had one third of the Senate in every House seat coming up and governor's seats coming up all over America. And what that is, it's not talked about too often, but we really have a right to raise the question to what degree we remain a democracy when so many people do not participate in the process. And then if you look at the elections, you found out that 96% of the incumbents were re-elected when one-third of the people voted. Okay? And um, so the, the question there is, how do you build a political movement which gets people excited, which makes people begin to understand that government, in fact, can represent their interests and deal with some of the problems facing uh, their lives? That's the challenge. Now, my own view, and it has been my view for many, many years, is that what we need in this country is what Jackson calls a rainbow coalition. But it has to be done outside of the Democratic Party. <laughs> and I say that here, and I'm delighted to be here with DSA because they are a non-sectarian group, and we have worked with them, and, and you know, we recognize that honest people will have differences of opinion. Uh, but my own feeling is the arguments of working within the Democratic Party and without go as follows. The argument for working within the Democratic Party is that people say, well, that's where the working class is. That's where the unions are. Let's stay within that. People are familiar with it. That's been their home for many, many years. There's truth to that, some truth to that. The argument against working within the Democratic Party is that for millions of Americans, both parties are looked upon with um, derision, with disrespect. Uh, polls show that half the American people don't even know the difference between the Democratic and Republican Party. And I can tell you very honestly, this is just the, as a practical politician, which is what I am, when I campaigned in Vermont, and I don't think Vermont is terribly different in this respect than any other state in the Union, you know, we went all over the state and we shook probably 30, 40,000 hands. I don't think that more than a dozen times people came up to me and said, Bernie, I can't vote for you because I'm a really strong Democrat and I believe in the Democratic Party, or I'm a strong Republican and I believe in the Republican Party. They don't. I think what ends up happening is people don't see much of a choice. There's the option, you know, you've got the Democrats, Republicans, sometimes this one's a little bit worse, sometimes this one's a little bit better. But I think that by standing up and, and telling the truth, that both parties are controlled by big money, which is clearly the case, that neither party, and I don't want to, and I should tell you, by the way, that within the Congress and, and the Democrats, you have a lot of good people, and I'm not here to put them down, so, and you know their names, good people who year after year have fought the good fight. But I think that nationally, the party has, on issue after issue, sold out so many times that if you go before the people and say, hey, I'm a Democrat, you don't usually generate a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> okay? Let me just touch on my experience in observing Congress and being, just give you some examples of what goes on there. You had, right now, one of the problems, I won't get into these, these are, you know, problems that we have to deal with up there on the Hill. Right now, one of the real constraints that we have is the so-called budget, uh, budget Reconciliation Act of 1990, which, as you know, was engineered by the leadership of the Democratic and Republican parties, ostensibly to deal with the deficit, which, in fact, was a very serious problem. So what they did is they say, okay, let's get together and we agree that you can't, if you cut military, you know, the conservatives and liberals, they came to an agreement which basically limited the Congress's ability to deal with many of the serious problems, okay? Now that agreement, the initial agreement in 1990, in the fall, called for a $60 billion cutback in Medicare over a five-year period, called for a 12-cent increase in the gasoline tax and other Cutbacks. Both parties agreed, the leadership of both parties agreed to that. Rank and file stood up, they modified it a little bit. The SNL fiasco, which is the greatest single ripoff in the history of this country, both parties caused it equally. Neither party likes to talk about it, and both parties are in bed in a very regressive bailout approach. Okay. I The recent budget, you know, some of you are concerned about homelessness, you're concerned about education, you're concerned about the environment. They reached a budget agreement. The president brought forth his proposal, and the Democrats said, no, this will not work for us, and they came back with their proposal, which was literally 99.4% of the president's proposal. They made changes. Okay. 
six tenths of one percent changes. And you know, I was obligated to vote against both proposals. But I think on issue after issue, you really find that um, the leadership of the two parties are not uh, are not very far apart. And I think, and I have no magical solutions. It's going to be very difficult. But I think if we break away from the Democratic Party, if we get the unions to begin to stand up to revitalize the union movement, bring them together with the environmental movement, the women's movement, the peace community. And I know it's easier said than done. Believe me, I know that. Uh, but I think that that is the long-term task in front of us. I think we have the issues that can move the American people. I think the American people are extremely alienated from the political process. They're angry. They're frustrated. They want to hear something. And I hope uh, that if we all stand together and fight for a society which guarantees health care to all of its people, a society where we have a fair tax system, a society where we take a bold approach to the environment, a society which wipes out homelessness, provides civil rights for all people. I think if we take the lead in bringing forward those issues, I think you'll be surprised at the kind of response that we'll get in our neighborhoods, in our cities, and in our states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Sanders. Uh, the Congressman will take questions and answers at this time. I just want to make one quick announcement that, that AFL-CIO's Jobs with Justice campaign and uh, many other groups in this city, including Democratic Socialists and the uh, United Electrical Workers, are supporting a June 6th demonstration. Uh, it's a nationwide demonstration, but it will be held in every major locality for health care for all. And uh, if you want more information about that, you should sign up on the table because the, uh, the, the place and time are being established, uh, you know, even now. So, yeah, almost as we speak. So uh, I'll turn the floor back over to the congressman. Okay, comments, questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Bernie, um, will the Gulf War be an issue in your 92 race? Yeah, we actually, um, a friendly Republican sent me a letter that the Republican chair was sending out around the state which urged people to write letters to the editor and so forth attacking me. I voted uh, not only against uh, the war, uh, but I against, uh, voted against two resolutions uh, congratulating the president. Uh, especially <laughs> especially one resolution which praised the president for literally, this is the word, his quote-unquote unerring judgment. <laughs> and I think what was upsetting about that, in all seriousness, again, and, and here you talk about the Democrats controlling the House, is, I mean, in terms of his unerring judgment, I think the Kurds might have a word or two to, to, to suggest about that. But the degree uh, to which, yeah, yeah, that there was a basic uh, total surrender uh, on that issue, uh, will, it, will it hurt me? Well, I think what our opponents are trying to do, and I, I don't think that they will be successful, because I think the people of our state are, are smart enough to see through that. What they are suggesting, and of course the way these resolutions were reading is, you know, Sanders, you know, the, the idea that I don't, didn't support the men and women of our state who went over there and put their lives on the line. And of course that was not the case. My concern and strong feeling was that the president was very wrong, his policy was very wrong, and I had a hard time from the very beginning saying, but I thought that Saddam Hussein could be defeated without a war, and then suddenly after the war started saying, well, actually I thought the policy was a pretty good policy. Um, and I couldn't do that, and uh, so I didn't. Yeah. How are they treating you in Congress? Did you get the committee assignments you wanted, and are you uh, asked to co-sponsor bills? Uh, yeah. Actually, on a personal level, uh, the people that have been really quite kind to me. Uh, when I ran for Congress, uh, because I wanted to get good committee assignments, what I said is that while I will absolutely remain as an independent, I wanted to function within the Democratic caucus in order to get committee assignments. What happened is that some of the conservatives in the Democratic Party and some others said, no, we don't want Sanders in there, and then I was asked if I would join the Democratic Party, and I said I wouldn't, and 
we reached an agreement uh, in which they said, okay, uh, don't try to come in, don't, don't get into a fight there, uh, and we will treat you as if you were a Democrat and give you, you know, basically the committee assignments that you want. And they kept their word on that. So I am on the, uh, so it worked out well for me. I mean, they didn't get the fight and the vision which they feared. I got the committee assignments that I wanted, so it, it worked out okay. Uh, I wanted to be on the banking uh, committee, and that's the committee I'm on, and I wanted to be on government operations, and that's the committee I'm on. And in terms of personal relationships, people have been very kind. And uh, yes, I'm asked to co-sponsor, and I, you know, I think I work uh, well with those people whose views are close to mine. Yeah, back there. Given the fact that a lot of the media seems to be lapdogs for corporations, is there any way that the progressive movement can make the media an ally and get some of the ideas to people who might not find it any other way? Well, that's a, a very good question. And uh, we have with us today, actually, uh, ironically, two people from Vermont who have been active for many, many years in public access television. Uh, actually are up here this week uh, to be with the Vermont congressional delegation. And they are really heroes and heroines of uh, public access television. One of them is Nat Air, and where's Lauren? Lauren, you here? There's Lauren, stand up, Lauren. They have uh, both done. <laughs> what we have done, and when I was mayor, we pushed this, and, and we're still continuing to push it, is, uh, I don't want to tell you that it's, you know, it's the major breakthrough, but it's a start. We have two public access channels now, which televise all the city council meetings in our district, and anybody wants to get on, the progressives have uh, a program. We have our, our progressives who are in the state legislature have a program. I'm on, uh, the Republicans have a program, I think Democrats may have a program. It educates people, and the more people are educated, I think the better we do. So I think using public access is important. But your point is, goes deeper than that. And that is that while I believe we need to move toward a third progressive political party, which has a pr agenda, an agenda that we take to the American people and in the process educate them quite simultaneously. We need to make, as a political issue, corporate control of the media and the degree of censorship which exists right now. And in fact, uh, there was a young woman who's here, I don't know if she's here right now, she gave me uh, some uh, a magazine published by the Fair People from New York. Are you familiar with those people? They're doing a very good job. And the issue, I would argue, that of all of the issues that I've talked about, and I usually get into this earlier, the issue of media and why, and I did touch upon that, why we do not see through, uh, through film, uh, through discussion, a progressive point of view is a real problem. And I, in fact, intend to do my best to deal with that legislatively in the Congress. All right, for a start, certainly in terms of the quote unquote public television network, let's make it public and not oil company uh, television. <laughs> it, is, it is a national disgrace that on the PBS, where you have serious people and good people, they are obligated to beg money from the mobile oil and the uh, Wall Street people in order to get programming on. So if you look at it, you find an extraordinary right-wing bent. You know, William Buckley and the other National Review people are there all over the place. And it was funny, uh, before I decided to run for Congress, I gave some thought to actually doing a program similar to what uh, Jesse Jackson is doing. And we went to the PBS people, and they were very kind, and they said, yeah, you know, you're right. There is a right word bent, and we would like to, uh, to do something about it, and we think you might be, you know, uh, possibly do a show. And then they said is, the only problem is, and they were quite serious, and, and, and the woman I was dealing with was, was generous. She was kind. She was trying to help. She says, you would, all you would have to do is raise $40,000 for every show. So this is what we mean by freedom of the press, okay? All you have to do is raise $2 million a year from General Electric and AT&T, and they will then put your show on television. The only problem is it is probably unlikely that General Electric or AT&T or the financial brokerage firms would really be sponsoring a show with a progressive bent. You see? And that's what we mean by freedom of expression. The truth is you can get on PBS if you got the money. Uh, so the answer is that for a start, PBS has got to be publicly financed. The second issue is with the commercial television networks, it becomes more difficult. You do not want, I do not want, government control. You know, we don't want to hear the government telling us how, what a wonderful job they're doing. On the other hand, equally important, and this is almost never discussed, you don't want corporate control. 
It is a disgrace that General Electric owns NBC. Everybody knows the obvious conflict of interest that exists. Here is General Electric, a major munitions manufacturer, right? General Electric, a strong anti-union company. General Electric, heavily involved in nuclear power. General Electric, who owned the former president of the United States and who paid no taxes. You remember, the early 80s, General Electric paid no taxes, federal taxes, because of the tax scams that Reagan brought forth. Now, these are the people who are bringing us the news on NBC. And it's not really much different on ABC or CBS. And we saw that during the Persian Gulf War. So the question is, what is the proper role to be played? And I don't know the answer. But certainly, what I am very disturbed about is that you turn on the television, you see murder, you see violence, you see escapism, you see every bloody thing except the reality of the American people. And that is kept away from us. You don't see that. So, you know, we are investigating and, and, and thinking about the proper role of the government. For example, just give you an example. If once a week you had a prime time program which had political leaders talking about major issues, maybe had some film describing the problem, okay, had debate, okay, and then on a Tuesday morning the kids go to school and the teacher says, what did you see on the environment? What did you see on the civil rights issue? What, what did you see on health care last night? Let's talk about it. The kids don't see these things. They're not on. They're not on. So, and then we can have that debate. So you have the thing and you say to the leadership, I wish I could tell you there were two parties of one party, maybe our party then will be on the other side. So all right, how are you going to address the problem? And then people begin to see that honest people can debate issues, have differences of opinion, and we begin to think politically, pragmatically, but you don't have that at all. It distresses me very, very much. So that is an issue. To get back to your point, your question is an excellent question. Clearly, we need major changes in terms of the mass media, uh, especially television. In terms of newspapers, you know, I think uh, what I would love to see, and it's basically only a financial question, I would love to see, you know, a strong daily or a weekly paper. I know, you know, we have in these times, The Guardian and so forth, but it would be nice if we could have a mass-produced paper that talks to working people and distribute it weekly. That would be a great thing. Uh, yeah, right here. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, I want your thoughts on two observations I had. One is that, uh, I've heard you've been described as a socialist, and so I was wondering, do you believe that we need to replace capitalism or a capitalist society with a socialist society? And the second observation was that two of your sponsors, the Democratic Socialists of America, have kind of always formally worked in the Democratic Party, and also the United Electrical Workers, another one of your uh, endorsers tonight, is usually traditionally often uh, for the Labor Party formation. I was wondering if you could address both. Well, that. I mean, as I indicated earlier, I'm here tonight in a very non-sectarian way. And I think that that's important. And uh, sure, I have a disagreement with the DSA, but there, you know, on many issues we, we agree, and reasonable people can disagree. And in the state of Vermont, we work very closely with the United Electrical Workers, uh, as it happens. I mean, to answer your question of capitalism and socialism, yes, I am a democratic socialist. Uh, what does that mean exactly? Well, at this point in American history, I would be very hard, I would be very delighted if we can move in a conservative manner, if you like, in the direction of a country like Sweden, which has a national health care system guaranteeing health care to all people, which has free college education for its kids, which has a decent housing program, which has given its workers far more rights. How many people know that in, in Sweden and most of Europe, every worker has five weeks paid vacation? That's what goes on there. They have national health care. Their kids can go to college without bankrupting the family. I mean, the real question, so I'm quite conservative and would be delighted if we can move to a society in my lifetime which at least dealt with the basic necessities of life. Right now, you have tens and tens of millions of people who, if they did not receive their check next week, would be sleeping out on the street. People are living under extraordinary anxiety, living on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, it is a good debate and a fair deb debate as to how you can move to a society where working people control the economy. That's a good debate, and I'm sympathetic to that debate. But for the moment, right now, I would be more than delighted if we could take care of the basic necessities of life and guarantee a decent income uh, for all of our people. Um, get, uh, yeah, right here. Uh, there's one uh, deep trend that you haven't discussed, which, which to my way of looking at things, explains the unprecedented degree of thought control 
exercise in this country through the media. I want to stand up so people can hear. Yeah. Okay. And other means uh, to suppress the debate because, and that trend is a reduction of labor content that the every day through biotechnology, computerization, robotization, the labor content is going down mm -hmm. and the, uh, the elite has less and less need of the working class. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, been, uh, it's abundantly clear that since at least the early 70s, which is probably the first time in human history, we live in a world ecosystem of plenitude rather than scarcity. There is enough of everything in the entire world. And that if the working class, if the majority of people were to realize that and have a debate on that, there would be unprecedented change for uh, uh, redemptive social change. And that the fact that there are so many drugs in this country, that the educational system is being destroyed in this country, is indicative that there is a genocidal pressure on the working class and people of color. And uh, how do you feel about that? And the rates at which that process is going to work with regard to the rate of possible organizations to counter those trends? That's a question, right? <laughs> I think a lot of what you're saying is true. I mean, you stop for a second. I mean, you, you know, one of the points is that so many things happen to us and we begin to become acculturated to it. We begin to take them for granted. For example, I remember I was teaching uh, last fall at the Kennedy School, very conservative institution, I should tell you by that. And um, we, uh, I had a forum with some uh, young people from Germany who came over. And this young lady had just, uh, they had visited, they went to New York City uh, the week before, and she was visibly agitated about what she had seen in the city of people eating out of garbage cans and sleeping out on the street. She was, she could not believe what she had seen. We get used to it because we see it all around us. In the same sense, your point is, imagine, we take for granted that robots, it's perfectly normal, somebody comes up, well, you're no longer needed here because I have a robot to replace you. You have no say about that decision. By the way, we're moving our factory to Mexico. Thank you for your 40 years of labor. Here's a little gold watch for you. And you have nothing to say about that. You've been beaten down and you understand how powerless you are. We take that for granted. That's who we are. And I think that that whole process of dehumanizing people, making us feel much less than human, making us accept that, is, a, is an awful and, and terrible thing. And I, I agree with uh, much of what you said. Why do I not see one woman's hand up here? What's going on in Baltimore? All right, there we go. Right. You said you were on the banking committee. Yeah. The banks in this country are in a frightening state. Yes. And I'd like you to comment on that and also on the impact of the national debt on what you hope to see in terms of uh, addressing our social needs with our hope for wealth, if we right. still have any. Um, the debt, the national debt, uh, and the deficit, which this year at 350 billion or so will be the largest in our history, is a very serious problem. And it's serious in this sense, is that if you go before members of Congress and you say to them, look, we've got a housing crisis, we've got an education crisis, we need money for the environment, we need money to reindustrialize the country, what are they going to tell you? They're going to say, madam, you are absolutely right, and I wish we could help you, but we have a huge national debt, right? That's what they will tell you. So you have that looming over you. The Congress is basically incapable of dealing with it. Now, in last year, they came together after months and months of very terrible and difficult debate. They came forward with a reconciliation package which cut Medicare by $43 billion, raised regressive taxes, and so forth and so on. And the end result of all of their labors are that this deficit this year is going to be the largest in history, and probably next year's will be as large, or almost as large, depending on the economy. What's the answer? How do you deal with a deficit in a fair and progressive manner? There are only two ways, and it's not very complicated. The reason you're in a deficit is every economist, conservative, radical, will tell you, is that over the last 10 years, we have given huge tax breaks to the rich and to the large corporations. So less money is coming into the federal coffers. And second of all, we have greatly expanded military spending. Less money is coming in, more money is coming out. So how do you deal with it? Not very complicated. You cut military spending, you raise taxes on the rich and the large corporations. And that's what you have to do. And that's, in fact, legislation that I have proposed, OK? In terms of the banking crisis, wow, it is a very serious problem. Uh, and I'm not going to come before you and tell you, you know, I'm taking a crash course there right now. 
uh, that I know everything about it. The, there are two issues now that the, my committee is dealing with. One of them is the quote-unquote recapitalization of the FDIC. Uh, the FDIC has been bailing out many commercial banks. The Bank of New England recently went under. They're running out of money. They need more money. What do we want to do? What's the ideal thing to do, which is not going to happen, but which I'll fight for? For a start, what you probably don't know in terms of bailouts is that the law says that you're only guaranteed $100,000. Some of you probably don't know that people who have more than $100,000 in the bank have already been bailed out. Okay? You didn't know that. It doesn't get publicized a whole lot, but they have been. That's under the scheme of too big to fail, that if we don't take it, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't believe in that, and I, I, and I, I won't support that. Uh, the second issue is how do you raise the money internally from the banking system itself in a progressive manner? Now, one of the things that's going on now is that many, many tens of billions of dollars in American banks, especially the large banks, are from foreign concerns, okay? They do not pay any assessment to the FDIC. In other words, that's how the FDIC makes its money, by assessing deposits. They do not. So what some of us want to do is not subsidize these foreign accounts. We want them to pay. That's going to be a very hard fight. The large banks do not want to see that. In fact, the small banks are sympathetic to that. In my state, we're mostly small banks. So that is to assess some of these foreign accounts so that it takes the burden off of the uh, American bank, uh, banking system. Uh, the real challenge that we face now is to make certain that you don't have a savings and loan part two. And that is to hit, basically as these banks collapse, for to have the FDIC run to the American public to bail them out. Um, and we are doing everything that we can to try to prevent that from happening. The bailout has got to be based to the degree that there's any bailout on asking the upper income people to start paying for it and not working people or middle income people. So. Um, yes, right here. Yeah, stand up and be loud, please. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about campaign reform, yeah. especially uh, as far as PACs, and do you see any kind of momentum as far as yeah. campaign? Um, that's a very important question, and I, and I should have touched on it earlier, because ultimately we're not going to have political reform in this country until you have campaign finance reform. What we have now is, as you know, the exception to the rule in terms of, of democracies around the world. Right now, if I'm a multimillionaire, essentially, I can put as much money as I want into my campaign, help you with your campaign, and it, it enables rich people to buy elections, and that's obviously uh, unacceptable. The three features that we need, and, and the Congress is now dealing with it, and you may get something. I am hopeful that that might be one area where Congress, uh, if not doing you know, an excellent job, at least might move forward to minimize some of the um, awful uh, aspects of the present uh, campaign finance system. The three components of a serious campaign finance reform package would be the following. Number one, and most importantly, are limitations as to the amount of money that can be spent. So if you and I are running together, and I'm a multi-zillionaire, and we could only spend, say, in my state, $500,000, it doesn't matter. You're neutralized. I have a chance to at least raise half the money that you would. You can only outspend me two to one, right? But when the sky is the limit, and you can raise 10 times more money than I can, most of the time, you're going to beat me, OK? So that's the first thing, a limitation on the amount of money that can be spent. Second of all, we need to do what most of the world does, and that, has, and that is a very significant amount of public funding of elections. That also equalizes it. And you know, I hear some people don't like the idea of public funding. Uh, they don't like taxpayers' dollars going into that. And the argument that many of us made, if you don't like that, you could have Mr. Keating uh, fund elections and then spend the rest of your life bailing out the SNLs to the tune of $500 billion. When these corporations fund candidates, when the drug companies fund candidates, the insurance companies, they know what they're paying for. You don't have national health care in this country because you have candidate and politician after politician on the take from the drug companies, the insurance companies, and so forth and so on. So we believe in public funding of elections. <laughs> and thirdly, importantly, and this is being discussed in Congress, is we've got to open up the airwaves. What goes on right now is you go out and you collect your money and you basically give it to the owner of the television station. That's what it is. Thank you for your donation. Here it is to the owner of the television station. 
So you have to either provide free or greatly discounted time, and hopefully in that process, do away with the 30-second TV ads. And, you know, mandate where somebody wants your vote. You know, that person is running for governor or mayor or whatever he or she is running for, but literally they've got to talk to you for five or 10 or 15 minutes rather than do a 30-second jingle. So those are the three important components the campaign finances. Yeah, gentlemen, right here. Environmentally, we are headed towards a catastrophe. The whole world, I mean, there is acid rain in Vermont, there is desertification in Africa, deforestation in, in the Amazon. So what is your platform to rectify that, if you may? Uh, did everybody hear the question? Well, the question uh, suggests, and I agree with it, is that environmentally, this planet is an extremely uh, fragile uh, shape. The truth of the matter is, I think, that unless we move radically and boldly as you indicate, uh, we may lose the planet for our grandchildren. Interestingly enough, I think, and I say this not because I want it to be that way, but I think it is that way, you're not going to deal effectively with the environmental crisis unless you deal with the economic crisis at the same time. They're the same issues. And a lot of people who are, you know, environmental, boy, this factory is polluting, close it down. But what happens to the workers who are going out on the street? Not my concern, I'm concerned about the environment. This farm is using a pesticide, close it down. But what happens to, what we have got to do is to understand the challenge, the real challenge, is how do you have a social system and an economy which does at least two things. Number one, it provides decently for its people at the same time as it does not destroy the environment. Uh, that's what you've got to do. That's why national health care is an environmental issue because that takes an enormous burden off the backs of working people. So the argument is either we have, and how many cities in America are faced with this dilemma? Mayors, you know, are faced with this dilemma. Here you have a factory which is polluting, it's poisoning its own workers, and the option is either you throw those workers out on the street or you save the environment. That is not a choice that we should have to make in 1991. The challenge that we face is, okay, how do you have a social system which provides educational opportunity, health care, et cetera, to its people, have an economic system which is producing what we need, what we need without destroying the environment? Now, what does that mean? It means, in my opinion, that you may not necessarily need three or four automobiles that get 15 miles a gallon, okay? <laughs> that we don't need air conditioning in cars which, with the present technology, are destroying the ozone layer, et cetera, et cetera, all right? But the challenge here, and I think, you know, and I applaud people like Jesse Jackson and others who are trying to do this, is not, is to bring together the environmental movement and the workers' movement. Because if they're separated, if the choice is either jobs or the environment, that is no choice at all. None of us. <laughs> and it can't work. Politically, it can't work. So we've got to bring people together. It's, it's not easy, but I think by providing people with the basic necessities of life, by producing the products that we need. In Vermont right now, what we are trying to do, we have a terrible problem. Probably it upsets me emotionally as much as anything. Our farmers are absolutely up against the wall. We are a dairy state. Price of milk has collapsed. Our farmers are losing money. They're going out of business. And we're trying, and I think with some success, to bring together the environmental movement with the farmers and the workers uh, to protect the farms. Uh, yeah, gentlemen right here. If you, if you shift the burden, the tax burden, back to the big corporations and the, the wealthy, how, what, what measures would you propose to prevent capital flight and to prevent well, you know, businesses from moving out sure. of our tax structure? Sure, that's a very good question. And the question is, you know, if you ask the rich and the large corporations to start paying their fair share of taxes, won't they pick up and flee and go someplace else where uh, they won't have to pay taxes? And that raises the question, and that's the problem that every mayor in America faces, every governor in America faced. And we had to deal with that when I was mayor of Burlington. You know, what they do, these corporations do, and it's not only an international thing, it's a state by state. You know, you want our company in your state, okay, how many years will you give us uh, of tax-free existence? How will you subsidize the workforce in our factory? Well, 
New Hampshire is doing more, what do you have to say? And so forth. And they play off one state against uh, state and city against city. I think basically that takes us to the issue. It's a very important question, the issue of capital flight. And it takes us to some radical conclusions. And that is, it gets back to the question of American industrial policy, OK? And I don't have a magical answer here. I really don't. But clearly, if the issue is the General Electric says, as they have said, as they have done, look, you know, we've been in your community for 30 or 40 years. Uh, you've kept us alive. Your workforce has sustained us. But we want to move now because we can get slave labor in Asia. We're picking up and going, and that's the end of the discussion. I think that the United States government has got to say, sorry, General Electric, that is not the end of the discussion. <laughs> and then I think, and it's a difficult question, all right? I think what you're ultimately moving toward is partnerships, you know, and it gets, you know, then you talk about economic, con the dem the democratic control of the economy. You're talking about a partnership between the private sector, the government, the unions, the working people. Now, one of the nice things that we know is that working people who have ownership in a plant, a shop, or a factory are not going to pick up and move to Mexico because this is their community. This is their life. And uh, in Burlington, for example, on a small scale, I don't want to overdo it, we work very uh, hard with locally owned businesses, with small businesses. We work with them because those were people who lived in our community, had pride in our community, and weren't going to pick up and go. But it is a, a very important issue. There is no question that the government is going to have to play an active role. The unions are going to have to play a role. And that takes, raises other issues about reinvesting in America. It has to do with pension funds of unions and why we're not using that money to reinvest in America and so forth. All right, maybe two more questions. Yeah, right here, please. Young woman. Um, you've talked a lot about the health care issue. And um, right now, there are a lot of bills in Congress calling for various kinds of national health care and reforms. I know the organization that I work for, Citizen Action, is you, supports lots of bills to raise the debate, but we're focused on one, which is the Russo yep. bill. I'm curious what your strategy sure. is from the other end. Do good. you co-sponsor all these bills? Or well, that's a good question. Uh, the answer is, in Russo, there are, at this point, to the best of my knowledge, I may be wrong, I don't think I am, there is one serious bill on national health care. That is Russo's. In two weeks, there's going to be another bill, which will be our bill. Russo's bill, to me, when I talk about serious or non-serious, what do I mean? What I mean is they got millions of, of bills. One is concerned about preventative health care for children. One is concerned about breast cancer. One is concerned about Alzheimer's disease. And, you know, each one is it, 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 tackling the problem in 50 different ways. To me, what is serious, what is serious? First of all, it means national health care, which is not necessarily universal health care. Okay? National health care means a single payer system similar to the Canadian system. You may have seen the piece in the Washington Post, which was done uh, just last week by uh, Dr. Steffi Woolhandler, who's on my staff, I should tell you, very proudly. And the point that she made in her article is that with 1,500 separate private insurance companies, with all of that billing and all of that confusion, all of that administrative waste, you're spending unnecessarily $100 billion more than we would if we had a Canadian system, okay? That money should go into health care and not paper pushing. So the first definition to me, and Russo deals with this issue, of a serious plan is to eliminate the private insurance companies and have a single payer system. Where we will disagree with Russo on some of the minor issues is I would like, his is a fairly centralized national plan. Ours will be more of the Canadian model in the sense of allowing each state to develop its own, granting a single payer system, uh, universal care to all people giving the states more flexibility than Rousseau's plan would do. I like that approach. In Canada, as you know, there really is not a Canadian system. Each province will raise its money in a little bit different way, will cater the needs of its system to its own particular uh, problems. And I prefer that little bit more decentralized approach. But his is a serious bill. Maybe the last question. All right, way in the back, young man back there. Yeah, um, Stand up so everyone can hear. Uh, this is related to health care and well, banking a little bit. My brother was, uh, helped organize a rally to, um, to protest Bush getting an award from Hopkins as a, a you know, honorary master's of public health. And he tried to get the, the head of, of Francis Scott Key Hospital to speak at that. And he did. And then the head of Francis Scott Key Hospital, which is under the Hopkins Health um, Program, mm -hmm. ended up um, getting a lot of flack from the Board of, of Trustees because 
uh, some of the members of the board of trustees were, for example, the head of the Maryland National Bank, which is you know, in a lot of trouble, but very conservative. Sounds like your average American university, right? <laughs> so what do you do? Um, is there an, like an uh, anti-ideological um, discrimination law? <laughs> yeah, yes there is. It's called building a progressive political movement. That's uh, what it is. But I, I think on that issue, I mean, you know, one of the, the sad things about what goes on today is the truth of the matter is, if you had President Bush here and you said, Mr. Bush, you will acknowledge, as he will, he's a smart man, you will acknowledge that there is a health care crisis in this country, and he'll say yes. I'll say, what is your program? Tell me, what is your program? And he will say, we have no program. That's true. I mean, that's true. In fact, I think he announced recently he has a task force or something which in a year or two years will be presenting some ideas. They have, that's, that's true, they, they have no program. So I think uh, the one program that the, the Reagan administration in his last days mentioned, quite literally, it was in our papers in Vermont, Reagan's solution was said, well, the cost of health care is going to go up. Our suggestion to the elderly and to the working people is save your money, you're going to need it. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and uh, thank you, Bernie Sanders, for giving us uh, this talk and answering our questions. I hope uh, this is the first of many visits to Baltimore, and hopefully we'll be able to send somebody to visit Vermont in the same way soon. Uh, but uh, in the meanwhile, if you want to stay around a while longer, we still have food. It might not be as hot as it was, but uh, you can stay and socialize uh, for a while. And uh, thank you again for coming out, and thank you, Bernie Sanders. <laughs>